Our next speaker is uh, Danielle Brandman, and uh, she has really been very successful as a educator and also a uh, investigator with focus in uh, fatty liver disease. And she's going to talk about, you know, the new therapeutics. Uh, Danielle is our associate director of the uh, Transbond um, Fellowship Program, and it really has been instrumental in teaching of uh, fellows as well as uh, the house staff, and uh, she's really made very important contribution in our teaching and education mission. Danielle. All right. Thank you, Francis. Well, definitely shifting gears a bit from portal hypertension to fatty liver, which I'm very passionate about and excited to talk about the therapeutics that are on the horizon. Um, keep in mind there are a lot. Um, I'm only going to cover a few of them, um, largely restricting uh, the discussion to compounds that have actually uh, been published uh, in journals within the past year or two. Um, but before I go into those details, um, I first want to just review the fatty liver basics, which I know you are all very well aware of, but just to make sure we're starting out on the same page. So NAFLD is our umbrella term, and under that falls NAFL, which is steatosis or fat without inflammation, and in most patients will not progress to cirrhosis, though a handful may. NASH is steatosis plus characteristic inflammation, and we know that that can progress to fibrosis and eventually cirrhosis and HCC. So when we're talking about treatment of fatty liver disease, especially in the context of new pharmacotherapy, we're largely focusing on patients with NASH, especially those with fibrosis, with the goal of preventing cirrhosis and HCC. We know that NAFLD is reaching epidemic proportions, affecting about a third of the US population, most of our obese patients, those pursuing bariatric surgery and who are diabetic, though NASH uh, affects a much smaller proportion, but still significant. Um, so we know that it still has uh, the uh, potential impact to have uh, a major public health effect. We should be thinking about fatty liver and our patients with metabolic syndrome comorbidities, and we sometimes think of NAFLD as being the hepatic manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. Now, what's really important in NASH is fibrosis stage. There have been several studies that have demonstrated that fibrosis stage is the most important predictor of liver-related mortality, with this co cohort showing that patients who have F3 or F4 disease have poor survival than control patients and those with milder stages of fibrosis. So that being said, the goals of NASH treatment ultimately should be resolution of NASH and stabilization, or even better, improvement in fibrosis. So what are we doing to actually manage these patients? I'll first just briefly talk about treating metabolic syndrome and fatty liver, which of course is really important in order to prevent uh, major cardiovascular events. Statins and metformin are both safe for use in fatty liver. And both of these compounds have been studied in uncontrolled trials that showed some benefit for fatty liver. However, when they were studied more rigorously in randomized control trials, there was no beneficial effect of these uh, medications for treatment of fatty liver. So really the bottom line is you can use these medications and they will have really great effects on diabetes and hyperlipidemia, but they should not be used for the sole purpose of treating fatty liver disease. What we have now available to all of us and what the primary care providers spend a lot of their time doing is counseling for lifestyle modification because we know that this works for fatty liver as well. So we counsel our patients on improvement in diet, particularly avoiding all of these awful sugar-sweetened beverages. Hopefully we don't have too many back there today. Um, and other uh, foods that have added sugar. Um, losing weight, at least 7% is required to improve NASH histology and at least stabilization of fibrosis. But the combination with exercise is important. At least 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercise and resistance training can have some beneficial effects on liver fat as well as insulin resistance. When the patients are morbidly obese and they're not responding to or participating in lifestyle modification, bariatric surgery is a really excellent option that can also improve NASH histology. 
specifically focusing on the four gut procedures such as sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass, and in some cases, the lap band. So what do we have currently available to us in the form of pharmacotherapy for treatment of NASH? I can't believe this study is now about seven years old at this point, but this is the, the PIVINS trial, um, which we were a part of this uh, study through the NASH Clinical Research Network, uh, and we studied pioglitazone versus vitamin E versus placebo in patients with biopsy-proven NASH. And please keep in mind that this study included only patients who were not diabetic. So the primary histologic outcome that was looked at in this group was a decrease in NASH activity score by at least two points with at least one point decrease in ballooning. So really no comment on fibrosis in this primary endpoint. So just looking at the results, taking them at face value, um, the vitamin E patients had significant improvements in uh, NASH histology in comparison uh, with the patients treated with placebo. The difference was statistically significant. Pioglitazone also seemed to be effective in reaching this primary outcome, but these patients did not meet the pre-specified statistical endpoint. When you actually dig into the data a little bit deeper, pioglitazone did appear to perform a little bit better in terms of resolution of NASH, but again, did not meet the primary endpoint. I will say I do use vitamin E in my patients who do have biopsy-proven NASH, and even though the guidelines say we're not supposed to use it in diabetics, I do all the time. Um, and a lot of the investigators within the NASH Clinical Research Network do as well. I think mainly because we don't really have anything else other than lifestyle modification at this point, though I think it will be interesting to see some longer-term safety data for patients who are in the NASH Clinical Research Network. So that's all we have right now. So I'll focus the rest of the talk on medications that are in development for treatment of NASH. So NASH pathogenesis is very complex, and believe it or not, this is actually one of the simplest figures that I could find uh, that kind of demonstrates all of these different pathways that are involved in NASH pathogenesis. Um, and some of the medications uh, that target these different pathways are highlighted as well. So the things that we really focus on in NASH are de novo lipogenesis, so really fat deposition within the liver and the metabolic stress associated with that. And we think that insulin resistance is an important part of this. So pioglitazone, which was just discussed, may have some impacts along this pathway. Cell injury is very important as well. So it's not just the fat, it's the fat plus the inflammation. And things involved there include oxidative stress, apoptosis, and inflammation. So vitamin E may be acting along the oxidative stress pathway. And there's several other medications that are of interest that are being evaluated these days as well. I think the holy grail for any treatment for liver disease that involves fibrosis is being an antifibrotic agent. Um, the medication that is mentioned here, simtuzumab, I'll discuss a little bit later, uh, but unfortunately it was shown not to be effective uh, in being an antifibrotic agent. And then finally, I think the gut is a really interesting target. Um, again, another way to potentially treat fatty liver or at least prevent its progression. Um, and the things that can be targeted through the gut-liver axis include bile acid absorption and metabolism, dietary fat absorption, as well as altering the microbiome, which I know is a really hot topic these days. And we know that the microbiome in patients with fatty liver differs from patients who do not have fatty liver. So I think this is an interesting potential component of treatment as well. So I'm first going to focus a bit on the insulin sensitizers. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about pioglitazone in the context of the PIVINS trial, but let's just go into a little bit more depth. Um, so pioglitazone is a P par gamma agonist, and you can see all of these wonderful and not so wonderful things that pioglitazone does. The great things that it does is that it is an insulin sensitizer, may improve insulin metabolism as well as uh, the balance of glucose homeostasis. However, the problems that we worry about with this medication is that it can lead to fluid retention by acting on the kidney, 
and may also cause patients to eat more. So this can result in weight gain. So I think this is one of the many reasons why there has been a little bit less enthusiasm for pioglitazone, despite its potential beneficial effects. Looking at some newer insulin sensitizers, such as liraglutide being one of the most well-known, um, or brand name Victoza, I think it's a really great drug. Um, it's a GLP-1 uh, agonist, um, and just to highlight some of its effects within the liver, can decrease glucose production, improves insulin sensitivity, may actually decrease appetite, so I think that's a really wonderful side effect, and may actually be cardioprotective. So, Looking at this figure, I think to myself, oh my gosh, this is the wonder drug. It should be in the water, or at least in the water for all of my fatty liver patients. It is also a good drug for diabetes um, and has been shown to be beneficial in promoting weight loss. Uh, the LEAN trial was published last year in The Lancet, and it, this is a very small randomized control trial of just under 50 patients comparing liraglutide lir uh, to placebo. The primary outcome was resolution of NASH without worsening of fibrosis. Um, and just looking at uh, several different histologic parameters, it looks like liraglutide uh, did appear to perform better than placebo um, and achieves, achieves statistically significant differences with regard to improvement in steatosis, improvement in ballooning, as well as less worsening of fibrosis. So I think as a class, the GLP-1 agonists are really quite appealing um, due to the lean trial results, though this was a very small study that was only about a year, so we need larger studies to validate these results, as well as longer-term follow-up. But I, I love the effect on weight loss, um, and I think patients would like that side effect as well. So, Getting back to PPAR, because I think the, the PPAR agonists are also really interesting, but we have to recognize there are four different PPARs, so not every PPAR agonist is equal. Um, we talked about pioglitazone already, that's the PPAR gamma. There's effects on the liver in terms of insulin sensitivity and lipid storage within the adipose tissue, but we also have alpha, beta, and delta. And we can see that uh, these receptors are present in the liver, the adip adipose tissue, the muscle, the heart, and the kidney. And depending upon uh, which receptor you're targeting, you may have effects on lipid metabolism, glycemic control, insulin sensitivity, fatty acid oxidation, and energy expenditure. So one medication that is uh, exploiting two of these pathways, the PPAR alpha uh, delta, is elefibrinor. Um, so I'm going to present the results from the GOLDEN trial, which uh, was published last year in gastroenterology. Um, the primary outcome of this trial was absence of at least one component of NASH without worsening of fibrosis. Um, and they looked at two different doses of elefibrinor compared with placebo. And using this predefined outcome, there was no significant difference between the treatment groups. However, post hoc, they kind of refined their definition of uh, improvement in NASH, or NASH resolution. And they define that as disappearance of ballooning and lobular inflammation, or persistence of only minimal inflammation. And when they used this modified outcome, uh, they found that the higher dose of elefibrinor seemed to be more effective than placebo, and the difference was now statistically significant. There also appeared to be an interaction between NASH activity score and treatment arm, which suggests that maybe people who have more severe NASH in terms of maybe more steatosis or more inflammation may have a more robust response. I would interpret these results with a grain of salt because I'm always a little suspicious when the outcome uh, is changed halfway through the analysis. Um, even though I think this outcome is actually very reasonable, I think when the study was designed, um, it was not designed with this outcome in mind, so it may not actually be powered um, appropriately. So I, I really look forward to seeing their phase three trial results. Um, Looking beyond the liver with elefibrinor, both doses appear to have favorable, favorable effects on LDL, triglycerides, and glucose homeostasis. However, there is the risk for nephrotoxicity. Renal failure or renal impairment 
um, were seen more frequently in uh, the patients who were treated with elafibronor versus placebo, though it seemed as though the patients who had a baseline creatinine greater than one uh, experienced this adverse event most frequently. So this does also give me a little bit of pause because patients with NASH have increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease. And while the renal effects seem to reverse after stopping the medications, if we're thinking about using these medications long term, I think we really have to think about, we have to think beyond the liver really. We might fix the liver, but are we going to hurt the kidneys in the end? There are several other PPAR and GLP agonists that are under study that I'm not going to cover at this point, but just know that there is a lot of interest uh, in this pathway. So I look forward to seeing more results from uh, different compounds. I'm going to move on to the uh, FXR agonist, uh, farnesoid X receptor. Um, so what is that? <laughs> so here's a figure just demonstrating um, the different pathways that FXR can uh, activate. So when FXR is activated, you can have impair, uh, decreased gluconeogenesis and improved insulin sensitivity. Looking at NASH specifically, there may be reduced liver inflammation, less fibrosis, and less hepatic lipid accumulation. So really all of the components of fatty liver. The other thing to be aware of is that activation of X FXR can reduce conversion of cholesterol into bile acids. So where this can be of potential concern is that this may lead to reduction in LDL and reduction in HDL, sorry, and increase in LDL. So uh, obeta-cholic acid is an FXR agonist, um, and I'll show you the results from the Flint trial, uh, which we were also part of through the NASH CRN, um, and the results were published last year. The outcome of, in this study was improvement in NAFLD activity score of at least two points with no worsening of fibrosis. So again, a little bit of a different outcome than what was reported for PIVNs. Um, this was a randomized trial, and what was found was that the patients treated with 25 milli milligrams of OCA had a higher proportion of uh, meeting the primary endpoint versus those who were treated with placebo. And the differences between the two groups were statistically significant. The potential problems with this medication is that pruritus is a really big issue, which uh, many of you may know if you've used this compound uh, to treat patients with PBC. Um, and you know, a fair number of patients do have to discontinue OCA uh, when they're treated for fatty liver. The other concern, as I alluded to, um, is that LDL increases uh, in response to OCA. Now, while in the Flint trial we did not see any uh, signal in terms of increased risk of cardiac events, I think with longer term use, um, you know, I think it could be a potential concern, so something that would really require a little bit more follow-up. <clears throat> the other thing of concern is that uh, two months ago, the FDA uh, came out with a safety announcement uh, with regard to use of obeta-cholic acid in primary biliary cirrhosis, events that have occurred post-approval in May of 2016. Um, so there were 19 cases of death reported to the FDA adverse event reporting system, with seven of those cases uh, due to worsening of PBC in patients with cirrhosis who were receiving inappropriately high doses. So they were basically receiving five milligrams a day rather than five milligrams per week, uh, up to 10 milligrams twice weekly in patients who have cirrhosis uh, with evidence of hepatic impairment. There were also 11 cases of serious liver injury. Um, and again, six of these patients were receiving doses higher than what was recommended for their stage of disease. And three of the patients in this category died and they were uh, included up here already. So I think one of my concerns here is that the doses that we're going to be using for obeta-cholic acid for fatty liver are higher than the doses that we would use for PBC. And if we're also thinking about targeting patients with more advanced disease, those patients may be at greater risk for developing this complication. So I think this is another case where we really need the phase three data um, and also thinking about who is most appropriate uh, to use obeta-cholic acid in. 
There are also several other FXR agonists that are under study. Um, and all of these compounds, of course, there's an interest in looking at the adverse event profile uh, given what was observed in obeta-cholic acid. Um, so I'm not going to report any of these results today. The final pathway that I'll discuss is the anti-inflammatory pathway. Um, the first drug I'll mention is Senecrivorock, which is a chemokine uh, receptor agonist, so CCR2 and 5. So what are those? So CCR2 uh, reduces monocytic and macrophage infiltration at the site of liver injury, and CCR5 impairs activation and pr uh, proliferation of hepatic stellate cells. So what this drug may do is reduce the amount of inflammation and also reduce the amount of fibrogenesis in areas where there is liver injury. Um, so the Centaur trial was uh, published a few months ago. Uh, it was a randomized control trial, and this is their one-year data, uh, where the primary outcome was at least a two-point improvement in NASH activity score with at least a one-point reduction in lobular inflammation or hepatocyte ballooning and no worsening of fibrosis. So what they found was that 16% of the active drug-treated patients versus 19% of placebo met this primary uh, endpoint. And uh, it's obviously not numerically different, and statistically there was no difference between those two groups. So then they chose to look at a composite outcome, which was resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis, or improvement in fibrosis and no worsening of NASH, which again, I think is clinically reasonable, but I always worry when they're kind of the post hoc analyses. When the outcome was evaluated in this manner, Senecrivorock did appear to uh, be better than the placebo-treated patients, with 18% of the active drug-treated uh, patients achieving this composite endpoint versus 10% of the placebo-treated patients. This difference was statistically significant, um, the one thing to note is that the serious adverse events were similar between groups, so the drug at least does appear to be safe and may be effective. Uh, we, we don't yet have published data on their two-year findings. Um, however, a press release was uh, issued that showed that the findings at two years appeared to be a little bit more impressive than one year. So I do look forward to seeing those results in more detail. And the last drug that I'll mention is uh, Salonsertib, which is an ASK1 inhibitor. So ASK1 stands for apoptosis signal regulating kinase. Um, and this is kind of a busy figure, but just to kind of focus on the important part. So here's ASK1. If this is activated, the things that end up getting activated downstream are collagen production within the stellate cells, so fibrogenesis, cytokine release from the Kupfer cells, so promoting inflammation, and within the hepatocytes, increase apoptosis, insulin resistance, and lipogenesis. So I think you know a really nice, nicely targeted drug, really looking at three different components of fatty liver. And Salonsertib really seeks to block this pathway. Um, so this study was published about two months ago now, uh, looking at a randomized controlled trial uh, comparing Salonsertib in combination with Simtuzumab versus Simtuzumab alone um, in NASH patients who had F2 to 3 fibrosis. However, Simtuzumab was later found to be ineffective as an antifibrotic agent, so for the purposes of this paper, Simtuzumab was analyzed as a placebo arm. The outcomes were reduction in fibrosis by at least one stage and progression to cirrhosis. So they're really not focusing on markers of NASH, really focusing on this compound as an antifibrotic agent. The data that was reported, um, because it was relatively short follow-up and a small cohort, there was no comment on statistical significance, so I'll just focus on the description of what their findings are. Um, so there were two different doses of Salonsertib, 18 versus 6 milligrams, and here's the Simtuzumab, or the placebo arm. And what was seen was that the patients treated with Salonsertib had numerically a greater improvement in the one-stage reduction in fibrosis in comparison with this placebo arm. Fewer patients treated with Salonsertib progressed to cirrhosis than those treated with Simtuzumab. I would say similar proportions had improvement in the NASH activity score by at least one point. 
Uh, same goes for NASH, and, uh, NASH activity improvement score of at least two points. To further illustrate their findings is a graphical representation of who got worse, who had no change, and who improved. And I think it's pretty clear that the uh, simtuzumab or placebo group had a much greater proportion of patients who had a progression of disease uh, versus the active drug-treated patients, uh, with more patients in the salon sirtib group showing improvement in fibrosis. So again, I think we, we need the phase three data before we can make any firm conclusions, but I'm cautiously optimistic about this compound, but I think things could change as, uh, uh, as the results come in. Um, there are so many other different targets, as I alluded to in that first figure, and I'm not going to talk about any of these because there's really not that much time, unfortunately, but just know that there is so much ongoing research and a lot of clinical trials, and the hope is that at least some of these drugs will, will actually get approved at some point to help our patients. So looking at the drugs that we have data for, which treatment so far seems to be the best? Well, I think it's a little bit hard to compare them head to head because these are separate studies. They were not designed from the statistical perspective to compare uh, the effects of the different drugs. There were a lot of different endpoints also, so we're not comparing apples to apples. And then the time point for assessment uh, differs amongst the studies as well as the study populations. But taking their results at face value, just to kind of summarize the major finding of these studies with regard to resolution of NASH. Vitamin E, pioglitazone, and l all appeared to perform better than placebo. For improvement in fibrosis, vitamin E, pioglitazone, and obetacolic acid may be better than placebo as well. And then for improvement uh, in, uh, sorry, in fibrosis, um, obetacolic acid and senecrivirac appear to per, uh, have statistically significant improvements over the placebo-treated patients. So to summarize, we know that NASH is a major public health problem that currently does not have adequate treatment beyond lifestyle modification. There are several drugs that are in development that have shown some benefit from the histologic perspective, but we really need additional data to confirm that these medications are in fact effective and are safe. There are many other compounds under investigation, and given the complex NASH pathogenesis, it is likely that we will need a combination therapy that targets multiple pathways. So at UCSF, we are actually running several of these clinical trials investigating some of the drugs that we just discussed. Um, so we're looking at obetacolic acid, elafibronor, emmercasin, which I didn't talk about, salonsertib, and senecrivirac. Um, and most of these are phase three trials. The emmercasin uh, trial is in phase two. And we're looking at all spectrums of disease, starting from F1 all the way up to decompensated cirrhosis. We have a really amazing team caring for our fatty liver patients, uh, both on the adult and the pediatric side. Uh, so myself and Bilal Hamid are investigators within the NASH CRN, and Nora Tarot is our site PI for that study. And on the pediatric side for the NASH CRN, we have Emily Perito and Phil Rosenthal. Um, two of our hepatologists have a special interest in special populations within fatty liver, so Jenny Price, uh, HIV in fatty liver, and Monica Sarkar looking at women, particularly younger women, and those affected by polycystic ovarian syndrome. We also have some really great study coordinators that are working with us on the NASH Clinical Research Network as well as clinical trials. So if you think that your patient may be a good candidate or interested in clinical trials, we would love to see them in our clinic for clinical purposes, of course, as well, um, but also to offer them a treatment that may be beneficial to them, as well as help to further the field of NASH research. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Dr. Turow. Danielle, maybe you can comment on bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the question was about uh, bariatric surgery. So, you know, I think a lot of our, our patients are hesitant to consider bariatric surgery because they know someone who had a really bad outcome following their surgery. So there's no way they're going to have it. 
Um, so, you know, I think, a, I think about bariatric surgery very early in these patients because usually by the time they've come to me, they've already tried all the usual stuff and it hasn't worked. Um, so bariatric surgery has been shown to have some beneficial effects on uh, NASH histology um, and may at least stabilize fibrosis, but it's important that we choose a foregut procedure like sleep gastrec gastrectomy or gastric bypass. If our patients are cirrhotic, we can consider a uh, sleeve gastrectomy in a select uh, case, um, usually child A or early child B. Um, and one of our surgeons, Dr. Andy Posselt, really has uh, expertise in this area. So it, it is an option. And given that, it, it is going to be quite some time, I think, until we have safe and effective treatments for fatty liver. I think bariatric surgery is still an important part of our treatment armamentarium for people with fatty liver. When any of these drugs are approved eventually, they're almost certainly going to be extremely expensive because they have to recoup what has been an extremely expensive venture in, in, in development. What, what information do we have on compliance in the NAFL NASH population? in terms of how reliable patients will take these agents. Yeah, so the question was, you know, the, these drugs are very likely to be expensive by the time they're approved, and, you know, given that this is a huge investment, not just on the, the part of the drug companies, but, um, you know, when we're paying for these drugs, we want to make sure that the patients are taking them. So what can we do to improve adherence? Um, so I'm not sure if that's been looked at specifically within the realm of NASH. I know, uh, I think this week, uh, there was, uh, what is it, Abilify uh, came out with having a, a device that will allow physicians to monitor compliance of medications. So I think that might be something interesting to look at within this population. Um, but no, I think you know we we want to know that if we prescribe these expensive, potentially expensive medications to our patients, are they actually taking them? I think focusing on side effect profile will be really important. Um, you know, I think if they if the patients have side effects that they can feel, or if it leads to weight gain, they're not going to want to take it. If the drugs either have you know no side effect or if they have beneficial side effects like weight loss, I think that's going to lead to positive reinforcement, and you know uh, re uh, reinforce the patients taking the medications. But I think that's something interesting to look at in the future. Yeah, Brock. Kind of going along with Dr. Black's question, um, again, very expensive medicines that we're going to be looking at, and all of these studies have short-term duration. And you've do you figure these are going to be drugs that are going to be like diabetes medicines that our patients are going to be expected to take into perpetuity? Or are we going to be doing short courses over time? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Given the cost, are these going to be like long-term medications like for hypertension or diabetes? Because hypertension and diabetes, unless the patients lose weight, the disease won't be cured. I think with fatty liver, we have to think about well, what, what is the endpoint we expect to reach? Um, you know, if we have a patient who has NASH and they have F2 disease and we think they've had resolution of NASH and stabilization or improvement in fibrosis, then, you know, can they stop the drug after five years? I don't think we know the answer to that yet, and I think even when the drugs are approved, we won't know the answer yet, and I think there will need to be a lot of post-marketing studies. I think it will end up being individualized based on the fibrosis stage for the patient, their other comorbidities, um, as well as what the life expectancy is. You know, if you get a patient who has all of the metabolic syndrome comorbidities and CAD, and they have F4 disease, and you get them down to an F2, and then they're 75, well, you have to think, how much more benefit can I get from this medication? But I, I don't think we have data to guide that yet. But, okay. Yeah. Last question. Just, just building on all those points about these drugs being expensive, you know, a beta-colic acid is $70,000 a year, and I don't think, you know, CAR treatment is 400000 so the sky's the limit on all these drugs now. So I think for that money, you could almost pay people for a personal trainer and give them nutrition for a year. <laughs> and that would be more cost effective. Right. And there's this, surprisingly for a public health epidemic, the liver community is not approaching as a public health thing enough. Even at the liver meetings, we give lip service to weight loss and diet. 
I mean, there's studies at UCSF and Toro showing that in obese pediatric patients, even two weeks of changing them from high fructose to grains and bread mm -hmm. gets fatty liver to decrease. So. Yeah, no, I think, especially given the scope of this problem, from the public health perspective, we do have to factor in cost for sure. And, you know, I think there, yeah, I, I won't get into a, a rant about the healthcare system, but, you know, I think there will have to be bargaining with uh, the drug companies to, to lower the price, especially when we're thinking about, you know, who has NASH. You know, in this country, a lot of the patients who have fatty liver are in the underserved areas with lower socioeconomic status. So they may not have the best insurance that will provide coverage for these expensive medications. Um, with regard to advocacy, um, there is actually a, a liver advocacy group, and I'm completely blanking on the name, uh, but there's act it's a former liver transplant recipient uh, from DC uh, who's an attorney um, who's really leading the charge and talking with Congress to advocate for liver disease and specifically fatty liver disease to say, hey, this is a big problem, we should focus on it. So I think it's sad that probably most people in this room didn't know about those efforts and I'm sad that I don't remember the name, but if I do find it, I will, I will let you know. But, but agreed, I think we have to get the word out that fatty liver is a big problem and um, for fatty liver patients, their third leading cause of death is liver disease. So we, we have to educate the primary care community because that's where so many of these patients live at this time. <laughs>